Bob Fletcher, are you there? Yes, sir, I sure am. Can well, you hear we me? Are, yes, we can hear you great. And we're just we That's just want to hear everything you're willing to share with us tonight. Um we we have actually played audio bites from your recent visit uh to InfoWars with Alex Jones and we we had noticed and I know that you did too that uh that Alex is very uncomfortable with the Planet X subject. <laughs> yes, he is. But then again, you know, the bottom line is, first off, it's very scary stuff, uh, you know, and, and I would wish that I was wrong, but I don't believe I am. Uh, and, of course, the bottom line is simply, you know, when this planet would approach really close or fairly close, that doesn't have to get, ter- you know, terribly close to our backyard, but once it passes by, uh, everything hits the fan. But what happens with an awful lot of people, and that, and it's all right because it's totally understandable, the bottom line, like with Alex. Now, Alex <clears throat> Alex literally had used to, he introduced me most of the times when I was on his program. He would introduce me as the one guy that actually persuaded him to go full-time into the radio, uh, the radio talk show business, period, Bob Fletcher. Uh, and then he used to follow that with a caveat and say that uh, everything Bob has ever found out or discovered or exposed has turned out to be 100% right. And he used to say, listen to Bob Fletcher, because he's never been wrong. And, of course, now I've been doing this pursuit of corrupted people in government for 30 years. All right, so that's why you go back to when Alex was still in school and listening and watching my my exposés himself. Now, that was the way he introduced me. But uh, the day um, uh, that I talked about uh, the incoming of Nibiru, um, he was freaked out. He um, uh, and the and the bottom line is this: uh, he's scared. It's an internal thing. I'm not going to say that it's financial. I believe it's totally an an internal personal thing with him. And and the concept, the things I was talking about, are, are very frightening. And some people. Um, you know, are just not going to buy into it until it's, uh, you know, until it's a, a a vivid in your backyard, it's all over kind of a situation. And uh, up to that point, there are many people, including Alex, uh, that, that are just um, uh, frightened off by this. Now, what I, w- I, was I would throw, like to... Uh, yes, we, go ahead. Well, yes. I, I wanted to get uh, Dr. Beer. Kenneth, Kenneth Beer is with us. Uh, he's, our, he, he's, he, he's been doing the radio show here with us now since all the way back to 2011 when we started it. And uh, he's really familiar with your work uh, all the way back to WWCR uh, and Shortwave Patriot Radio. And, and, and uh, Kenneth worked with Bill Cooper in Kaji back in the 90s. Kenneth, say hello. Hey Bob, it's it's good to actually hear you on the show. I remember hearing you years ago on Patriot Broadcast Networks and various uh, uh, forums, and it's it's amazing that you're actually on the show now. So I'm all ears tonight, and I can't wait to hear what you're going to share. But I've followed you for so long, and I'm kind of like Alex Jones with you. You opened my eyes. Well, <clears throat> thank you. I greatly appreciate that. And and. What I probably should do is now I have to do this very briefly because uh, I've been doing it so long, and my personal story is so complex and what have you that. But but I, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. But for the people that do not know who I am, they can go of course to my website, which is bobfletcherinvestigations.com. Now, if you just go on Google and put in Bob Fletcher, uh, you'll end up there also because. Um, I guess I'm kind of like all over the place there, like a sort of like a bad fungus, I guess. But uh, uh, at least to the uh, to the bad guys in government. Um, so as a matter of fact, I I had to quote uh, Senator Kerry, John Kerry, who's now of course Secretary of State. I had assisted his offices profusely many years ago in one of the inquiries relative to drugs and government officials, and. Um, I had just run for the United States Congress in 1990, and uh, he asked me uh, what if I. Had, and matter of fact, I almost took that seat. But he asked me uh, what what would have happened if I had taken 
the the seat and become the, uh, up there in Congress. And I jokingly said, well, I would be the biggest pain in the butt that they ever had in Washington. And uh, Senator Kerry's um, uh, response there was that he said, I got news, you already are one of the biggest pains in the butts in Washington. And that was, of course, back in 1990. That's a long time ago. But uh, it's one of the best best things I ever heard out of um, a senator's mouth out of Washington, D.C., that I was already causing them uh, uh, more grief than they wanted to, to uh, share. But uh, for those folks who don't know me, I got involved totally non-intentionally. Um, I had a company, was taken over. I merged. It's not taken over. It's not, well, yeah, maybe that is the right word. I merged my company with another company in Atlanta, Georgia, in 1985 or 86, that period of time, and it turned out to be run and operating by a covert central intelligence national security operative who supplies weapons for all of the small wars that we re you referred to just a few minutes ago around the world um, that have been taking place. Uh, this was a central intelligence operation. They took over my business to use it as a covert front. And then, and again, it's totally unknown to myself. There's no way of knowing that until you're already into it. Uh, once I had signed papers and merged, and a few months into it, uh, then I started meeting all of these uh, military generals and officers and covert operatives and uh, 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 Lieutenant Colonel Bo Greitz at that time is a good friend of mine um, at this point in time at that time I met him uh, when he had just come back from doing uh, covert uh, operations looking for prisoners of war and that was in 86 that period of time uh, and they were still um, uh, Bo was still bringing uh, and getting uh, prisoners of war out of the old Vietnam War uh, and uh, these people of course who I'm talking about that supply the weapons for all these small wars uh, make multi, multi millions of dollars. And of course, they also end up being involved with drug smuggling, Oliver North and all of that Iran Contra business. I was a witness in that and then became, because of it chasing pe those people, uh, one of course leads to another, I became involved with at least eight to ten very serious top-level um, uh, investigations at the congressional level. Now, I also have to add that absolutely none of them go any place. They are all complete garbage for the television for the most part and to get senators and congressmen reelected because they show you all the wonderful things they were trying to do to clean up America, and in most cases it's all garbage. Now, put that aside, that's how I got involved with this stuff of chasing and following, going after criminal people, criminal personalities at the highest levels of our government, all the way up to the White House, and it's nonpartisan. Uh, they're crooks, liars, and thieves on both sides of the fence, Anybody that goes up there as an honest congressman, and I will use Sonny Bono as a perfect example, a guy, anybody that gets in there and goes and ends up getting into the Senate and the Congress, that basically at the very beginning, they kind of pull you aside and have a little meeting with you, which basically means um, uh, that if you come up here and cause a lot of grief, you'll not be back here again for a second term. If you come up and you uh, cooperate, things will run really smooth and you can move up to the highest levels in our government uh, if you're a good guy. Uh, from their point of view, a good guy is if somebody that keeps their mouth shut regardless of what they see. And in Sonny's case, he was appalled when he got up into the, the den of thieves in Washington and realized how unbelievably criminal everybody was up there. Uh, and uh, there's many, many wonderful stories, but we don't have time to get into those this evening. But uh, nonetheless, uh, Sonny, I bring him up because uh, when he and I, I worked with 
Sonny supplying him with information on and documentation, uh, the best that you can possibly get, uh, supplied him with reams and reams of information related to the central intelligence involvement and other agencies, uh, embassies and everybody else, with the drug smuggling, murder, and assassinations. Uh, when I worked with him supplying material, probably it was probably over a year, uh, and then, then got down to uh, really sharpening pencils, and uh, finally they, uh, his, his office called me back and told me that um, uh, as soon as Sonny got back from the Christmas holidays, the first thing on the calendar was the investigation at the congressional intelligence level with all of my material and some material supplied by other people. They wanted to make sure I was ready to come back into Washington. I was living in Los Angeles at the time. Was I ready to come back and make sure that I had all of my stuff with me and that I assist them in bringing in other witnesses, which included drug smugglers and everybody you could imagine that was going to come forward to a brand new congressional investigation and for one of the first times in the history of congressional inquiries, Sonny's offices in, informed me that they had subpoena powers. So they were going to be able to force people to come in and force them to either answer questions or they actually could put them in jail until they decided to cooperate. That never happens normally in any of these inquiries. You know, these guys can go in and sit down, and then they say, oh, I don't remember, or I can't come in right now, I'm doing something else, or this or that, whatever, and they sidestep the serious questions. That wasn't going to happen on this inquiry, and uh, I loved it. I was I was overwhelmed with joy, and uh, I thought, oh, my God, this is going to be one of the first times we're going to be able to nail people right to the wall with with unbelievable criminal activities coming right out of the White House uh, and going up that far. And 10 days later, Sonny Mono was murdered on the top of the ski slopes in, mm. in uh, Nevada. Of course, they told everybody, everybody can remember, they had this, this traumatic uh, uh, announcement that Sonny had uh, crashed into a tree and died from running into a tree with his skis on. And of course, nobody knew because this has been kept very much undercover. The, uh, the the putting together this investigation, you know, somebody nobody knew that at all. And of course, here I'm sitting in Los Angeles. Uh, I almost uh, I don't know. I almost I could have fallen off of my sofa. I guess uh, when I saw the news, when I called back into his offices, uh, like a day later, day or two afterwards. Nobody, they wouldn't take my calls, and I thought. Now this is a the fellow in the, the the gentleman that ran the office basically for Sonny uh, was a guy I had been close with. You know, we had lunch when I was in um, Washington and what have you. Uh, as a matter of fact, one time when I had gone to Washington about two years ahead of this period of time, maybe maybe a year ahead, um, I was in Washington to see stop in there. I stopped in. Uh, along with other activities I had there, and uh, uh, Frank, his name Frank Cullen, he came out and he said, uh, I, I, I looked into the office and they were had tapes up and they were blocking people off, and and he came out and he said, we got to, we we'll have to go down to the restaurant, we can't come in, uh, and I said, what what's going on? Because people were up on the desks. And there was powder all over the place from the ceiling, and they were climbing around doing all sorts of stuff. They had electronic equipment, three or four technicians wandering around in Sonny's offices in the Congress building. And I said, what is going on? And they said, uh, Frank said, that they, somebody's been tapping our entire offices. And Now, read my lips, right? tapping the offices of a congressman in the congressional buildings, in his office buildings. And I said, what in the world? I said, well, you know, that doesn't surprise me what, what we're doing, what we're in the middle of right now. And, of course, that would have been at the very beginning of uh, when I was supplying them with the uh, information that I'm referring to 
uh, of uh, drug operations and what have you. So anyhow, the bottom line is um, uh, that's the kind of stuff I've been involved with, and literally I am afraid, I feel, it has really devastated me, I feel that Sonny was murdered because of the material that I had supplied him, uh, had supplied him with, and uh, and the invest in investigation that was in fact uh, uh, on, re ready to be cranked up. As soon as he got back, it was the first thing on the menu. Probably would have taken another, oh maybe probably 15 days uh, by the time uh, after the first of the year, uh, and uh, we would have been up there, uh, and it would have been devastating. I have live audio and I have live videos of um uh Kuhn, one of the, uh, uh, the biggest biggest drug smugglers in the world out of Burma pulled out his records and um uh it was videotaped by Lieutenant Lieutenant Colonel Bo Greitz. He he actually videotaped it when Kuhn saw this is a drug smuggler in Burma that was the primary supplier of opiates into the free world for many years. He has 40,000 soldiers on the mountainside in Burma. Uh, so this is not like five guys, you know, mi mixing funny white powder down in Mexico someplace. This is a huge operation with truckloads of the opiates coming out of um, the top of the hill in Burma. And he had live, which I supplied to Sonny, live recorded videos of Kunsa's entire distribution leadership in Chinese with their books. They opened their books up going back many, many years, naming the central intelligence and ambassadorial uh, level persons that had bought the drugs and set up the financing with the, with the mafia et cetera, et cetera, read their names live out of the books on the hillside in China, in Burma. And uh, that's the kind of evidence I had supplied, along with documentation and what have you, connecting right into people like uh, Richard Armitage, who was uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense for the United States of America under the Bush administration. Anyhow, that's the type of stuff I'd been doing. So now let's figure out how that relates to the incoming of the possibility of uh, Nibiru headed back in close to the United, to the to the Earth. Uh, what had happened uh, a few years ago? I got looking into the extraordinary amount of money that was disappearing from the United States. Uh, now, I, I, originally. I, I, I got to actually admit, I didn't know anything about Planet X. I, I, you know, I had heard about it. It's one of those things, like so many millions of things, you hear about stuff, but then if it doesn't move to the forefront or you're not directly involved with it, like in my case, if you if you're not directly involved with it, it you know, it's it's like just just sort of out there, you know, and nobody could. No, there was no real good evidence uh, as far as I was concerned um, many, many years ago to ever pay any attention to it. But uh, when I started looking into the money that was disappearing, now what am I talking about? For one thing I'm talking about is that all the gold in Fort Knox is gone. It no longer exists. It has been taken, stolen, removed. All right. Now, when I say all of it... Uh, whatever maybe i'm maybe i'm talking about you know 97% of it or whatever uh there's always enough a couple of roomfuls of gold that people could look at uh but that wouldn't mean anything because if you didn't see all of it or you didn't have an an accounting of it an audit of all of it uh, you know it really doesn't mean anything uh you know we have the big building in Fort Knox that's supposedly filled with it uh, and then, of course, we have it in New York City and a couple of major banks. They have some of it put away and, uh, you know, behind bars, if you will. And you could go there and probably still see some. Uh, they still have it in, in a few other locations. But for the most part, when you're talking tons, tons of gold in gold bullion, 
uh, tons and tons of it like there was at one point in time, uh, that's not there anymore. That's just gone. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, about in 2010 or 11, whenever it was, after the financial banking crash around the world, the global pinch, all right, that affected everybody, 2008, 9, 10, that period of time, um, the the banks or the those banking entities from Germany and a few other places, they came forward over here to the Federal Reserve and they said, we need a couple of tons of our gold. They have all those nations around the world have deposited their gold, the huge amounts of their gold, at the Fort Knox vaults as a security situation because some of the nations are, are, have always been a little shaky since World War II, and they worried basically about uh, random overthrow of the governments or whatever, that, that type of insurgencies and what all. So they had put tons and tons. I believe the amount that Germany had in there was 1,500 tons of gold, just themselves. Well, anyhow, they came forward and asked for it, and the Federal Reserve said, oh, no, you can't get it right now. Uh-oh, what's wrong with that picture? Uh, you know, I mean, if you got if you got a couple thousand dollars of mine, I would be upset. But if you had a couple thousand tons of gold of mine, I would really be upset. Uh, you know, it kind of figures that the, the average guy can't even perceive. Uh, so following that, there were several other nations that came forward. They asked for their gold. And they were told the same thing. And inter interestingly, they were told to kind of get back in 2020, in the year 2020, they could probably get a good audit or some of their gold. That was kind of what the original answer was. And then, of course, we had Ron Paul came forward in Washington, and he has for several years said uh, he wants an audit. You know, we, we require an audit. The United States wants to know if the gold is there, because he agrees with me, and that is that it's gone. And, of course, they told him the same thing. Basically, they just said, go away. You have no right to even require or request at the senator congressional level that you do not have the right, because that's the way it's set up in terms of the Federal Reserve creation and regulations Nobody outside of their own group of bankers had the ability to audit or even request an audit. And, of course, that doesn't happen. Uh, you know, that's kind of like um, whatever, having um, um, uh, Al Capone keep track of the mobsters for you or something like that. So that doesn't <laughs> happen. Right. All right. So, all right, so now we have – now that kind of like really bothers me, and I'm listening to that and watching that and all, and I thought – you know, what's wrong with that picture? And then Donald Rumsfeld, the guy that was in charge of the Department of Defense at that time, uh, came forward on the floor of the Congress. Now, this is important. It's the date that he did this, the day before the 9-11 terrorist event in New York. Rumsfeld came forward on the floor of the Congress and said that he had lost the, the, the Department of of defense had lost 2.3 trillion dollars. Uh, he said it went back a few years, but apparently they just can't locate it. They don't know where it went. 2.3 trillion over about 10 years. Then, of course, we had the next day was the event that um, occupied the news for the next seven, eight months, for crying out loud, and that was the outrageous event in New York City. End of story. You never heard again. You never heard a word about Rumsfeld and the Department of Defense missing and losing their money. And by the way, that amount of money equals $8,000 for every man, woman, and child in the United States of America. That's how much that is. Wow. Okay, so let's move forward. What else bothered me? Uh, the woman who is in charge of keeping track of the Federal Reserve distribution of funds 
from uh, the Federal Reserve into international banking, she came out and somebody asked her on the floor of the Congress and an inquiry uh, that they had understood that somehow there was $9 trillion off of the books progressively over the last few years of the banking Federal Reserve being lent out to people, banks, bank systems in Europe, but that they understood it was quote-unquote off the books and it was not really definable as to where it had gone. And she had not acknowledged that that was a fact. Uh, so there is nine trillion. Now we're not even talking billions. We're talking trillion here. And again, it was progressive over a period of time. But basically, she said uh, that she would look into it. But yeah, she understood there was sort of a, you know, again, they just they just point were not positive where it had gone to. So anyhow, done deal. There goes uh, uh, nine trillion. By the way, that works out to about thirty thousand dollars for every man, woman, and child in the the United States of America. So we're almost getting serious money here. Um, So anyhow, when I I put all this together, and then there was many, many other uh, outrageous um, uh, situations with um, huge, gigantic amounts of money just vanishing progressively over 10, 15, 20 years. So uh, now you've got to realize, see, there's no way to to money launder a trillion dollars. Not one trillion. You can't. One trillion. And we're talking 2.3 vanished from the Defense Department. Uh, if you were slick enough to embezzle that out of the uh, out of the funding of the Defense Department, uh, you can't go to the local bank and, and hide it in your safety deposit box. All right? Uh, not even, you know, Pablo Escobar, the drug smuggling operations, they couldn't do anything with that. So I sat, you know, and I was sitting, I was thinking, what in the world, where could money like that go to? What are we talking about here? And again, it's 20, 30 years maybe altogether. This is a total outrageous volume vanished. And then I remembered somebody in 94 had come to me, and not just one person, but many people. And I was involved with a bunch of different things, and I testified before the U.S. Uh, Intelligence Committee myself in Washington on a couple of things. And the bottom line was uh, I recalled somebody saying, Bob, do you, are you familiar with the underground facilities that they're building all over the United States? these giant underground hideouts. And, of course, I said, well, you know, I was familiar with some of the mil- the military operations, of course, and uh, I knew we had some of the biggest and best underground facilities on Earth for NORAD and that type of, uh, you know, operations. And then, of course, somebody said, well, you know, I'm talking about uh, like, like even at the, um, uh, the Denver airport is a giant underground facility. And, of course, I had a friend that was real close to that and a couple other people that were involved in the financing and what have you of, uh, of government and, uh, what, and all of that. So I was familiar, and I also was familiar that that had gone from being a construction of a fancy airport into being uh, extraordinarily over budget. I mean, they kept going, you know, 40 billion, 40, 40 Forty million here, sixty million there, twenty million here. I mean, it was just kept going right through the ceiling in terms of cost factor. And after they finished it in '95 and and opened it up for use, uh, I had gone with a friend of mine, and we snuck down underneath, underground, into some of the facilities below, and they were huge. They were gigantic. We had tunnels and tunnels and all kinds of offices and what have, just all kinds of things underneath there. Had nothing to do with the, with the uh, airplanes coming in and out. And uh, entire seven-floor buildings that were buried underground there and what have you. Um, under And today, now that was in 95, and I actually photographed and got some film, whatever, that actually somebody ended up stealing, but... Um, it doesn't make any difference because now we do have we we have a lot more. Uh, I have live footage underneath these facilities uh, as we speak. But the uh, uh, the point was uh, that that was a heads up for me. 
And then I, I had remember talking to some truck drivers, said they had gone from one facility to another facility probably 800 miles away, driving in his 18-wheeler, 40-foot truck, making deliveries between different points underground. And um, uh, by the way, we're talking about uh, facilities so large that two lanes cross each other for 18-wheelers underground and mag-levitated trains going uh, as fast as the speed of sound underground from one wow. location to another. Uh, so uh, the the next point in in my uh, in in my uh, uh, process of uh, looking into this stuff uh, was the, uh, also the realization that um, some, somebody had come to me. Here's what had happened, and so you explain this. Once I got involved with all of this stuff and had been doing it for 30 years. I had so many people coming, and, and they would say, hey, you know, I work for the CIA, or I work for this, or I work for that. And, and, and I mean, I would meet them in you know, some cases face-to-face. -face. Several of them became friends. And they would just say, look, I can't say, I can't come out. I'll get blown away, you know. But, but let me just give you this. And I would get a packet of information, or I'd get some photographs, or I would get this, or I'd get that, or whatever. And that happened over and over again. Because so many of the bad guys were the same bad guys interfaced with people 10, 20 years ago, and now they're mixed with a different group, maybe three or four other guys, and they're carrying out more covert operations around the world uh, doing A, B, and C. So I, that was what had happened to me, see. So I, it ended up where I was like a, a sounding board, and I used to, again, uh, when different investigations came up, congressmen, senatorial offices, et cetera, would call me and they would say, hey, we're looking into this. Do you have anything with this guy and that guy or that bank or this? And I would say either no, I don't, uh, or I would say, oh, yeah, wait a minute. Uh, he was involved with A, B, and C over there five years ago. So that was what had happened. That was what had created my original uh, lifestyle, if you will. Uh, and keeping me in this junk. So now we, let's get back to all the crazy stuff going on underground. I had somebody came to me and said, you know, uh, the, these underground facilities, they're, uh, they're all over the United States, but to add to it, uh, they're doing it all over the world, and the major nations of the world are doing a similar thing building these underground hideouts. And they had, you know, they said, you know, well, let me let me show you this in Russia. Let me show you what they're doing in China. Let me show you this. So then I started thinking, what in the world's going on? All of a sudden these criminals have been stealing millions for their own pockets. Now they shifted gears and they're stealing billions and billions adding up to trillions and they're building underground hideouts. And, and then I looked into it, and I found out that they were filling them with survival foods by the tons, tons and tons and tons of underground facilities being filled with tons and tons of um, survival dried foods and goods and material. Then I found out they had some facilities where they were growing, had set up underground growing operations so that they could grow actually foodstuffs in certain of these underground facilities. Then I found out about a thing called the International Seed Vault. Now that's not terribly secret, but basically it's, it's up in Norway and it was, goes into the, granite, the side of a granite frozen mountain in Norway, uh, kind of on an island if you will, um, highly secured, totally secret entrances only with, with military guards, etc. But they have seeds to regenerate all living foodstuffs on the face of the earth if, in fact, all of those things were eliminated. If all of a sudden everything was wiped out and we had to replant, we have multi-millions of seeds in the Norway International Seed Vault. Oh, wow, that's pretty strange. All right, so now I'm adding all this stuff up, 
And then someone comes to me, oh, and by the way, the Russians, in 2010, they put out a mandate for themselves internally to build and create 10, excuse me, 5,000 underground emergency shelters. That was in 2010. Their, their uh, mandate was to accomplish that by 2013. That was a targeted date. Uh, they did complete them for the most part. One of them, most of them are small. They're not what I'm talking. They're not eight or ten thousand people to get underground. They're they're smaller facilities, but one of them can handle over sixty thousand people underground wow. in Russia. All right. So um, and then, like I said, we have these. Uh, and then China. China's been doing the same thing. Uh, they have. And these are dug with these gigantic digging tunnel boring uh, machines that are so large, uh, the bigger ones, they can punch, uh, go a couple of miles a day into the side of a mountain. And when they're done, back out, and you could drive an eight, 18 wheeler down uh, where they've been. Uh, that's it. Just punch a big hole, come back out, and you could drive an 1800, uh, excuse me, an 18 wheeler facility into the side of a mountain or underground. So that's how they're built in terms of the, the basic drilling of these things. The red Chinese have one of the one single drill that is three of them in tandem, big enough so that they go into the side of a mountain, pull it out, and two 18-wheelers can go side by side uh, driving uh, into or under the ground with these facilities. So... The next point, obviously, was what in the world, what is the possible reason for this kind of expenditure of funds? And, and by the way, see, if anybody wants to know, everybody ever scratch their head and say, um, how come they don't fix 50,000 bridges and tunnels and what have you in the United States of America, all of our infrastructure? They haven't spent a penny on that stuff in 30 years. We have bridges today with a million cars going over it every day into major cities that, that are technically should be condemned. You know, and the numbers of that, by the way, and of course all this stuff, you know, a guy can individually look up on, the, on your computers. You want to find about, uh, just put something in your computer on Google like, um, uh, infra infrastructure problems in America and put that up and you see the figures it will blow your mind but they're not doing anything they're not doing anything on any of that stuff the money is not there where is all the money the money is underground in these hideouts for the elite they then also spent in the last few years millions and millions of dollars buying military equipment for the police and the sheriffs and for security operations, bullets, machine guns, under the title of, um, how about the uh, forest rangers with 15 uh, uh, a million bullets uh, purchased under their name. You know, uh, the um, uh, not only forest ranger, how about the Internal Revenue Service? thousands of bullets and machine guns and that type of stuff, all right? So we say, well, what, well, what's that got to do with it, Bob? Well, it has to do with social riot control up on the top of the ground when the elite are down under the ground. And then finally it came to me, uh, exactly, I don't remember what, the, what it was. Uh, maybe I told some people I was looking into all these different things. And somebody simply said, uh, well, you know, Nibiru, Planet X, has been finally really discovered, and it's coming back. So then I started doing some snooping because I didn't even know what they were talking about. And I said, well, you know, I said, oh, yeah, I remember something about that. And back, as a matter of fact, in the 50s and the 60s, it was like in Look Magazine, Reader's Digest, and for all of our young people out there, these were um, uh, big, important magazines in the United States that were better than most of the newspapers. And they had done stories about Planet X 
in the early 50s and 60s. But at that time, they said, even if it was really found and located, don't worry about it because it's 50 or 60 years from now, right? Uh Uh-oh. Guess what, guys? It's 50 or 60 years since they wrote those stories, okay? So now is the time you do start worrying about it. Somebody brought to my attention a fellow named Zachariah Sitchin. It's a guy that had done the... um, uh, had had gone into the Sumerian clay tablets. By the way, there was like thousands and thousands discovered uh, over there in uh, Iran uh, going back 4,000 years. And uh, he deciphered them and discovered that there was this planet called Nibiru, which is planet X or part of the same small system, uh, that... Uh, was coming around, had come around several different times, but it had been written up in these clay tablets uh, that that basically that was what had generated Noah's floods. One of the close passings of this planet X, Nibiru, was what had created the floods in um, uh, Noah's time. Now, there's always all kinds of, because when you start going back, a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand years, and deciphering things and and analyzing them and all. It takes an awful lot of study to uh, to do the right comparisons uh, as to um, time and date. The dates have all changed. Calendars had changed. There's differences of biblical time uh, relative ca- to calendars and timekeeping relative to uh, uh, other uh, nation states at that you know, going back that far in antiquity. But the Bible writes about it. The Koran writes about it. There have been cave drawings and writings on the walls that writes about it. And then, uh, of course, when this Dr. Sitchin finished doing his uh, deciphering of this thing and said that it was going to be coming back around, uh, of course, you know, it's a typical... Uh, um, human nature just like Alex Jones being uh, afraid of the fact that it might be true it's human nature in science that if you don't have a good video of this thing uh, nobody believes you it takes an awful lot to get uh, science to change their opinions or change their precepts of of, um, things, events, astronomy whatever it is but lo and behold Dr. Sitchin finds out that a fellow named Dr. Harrington, who ran the, um, uh, actually was the head of the observatory, the Naval Observatory for the United States of America, he got interested in Sitchin's proposal on this faraway planet that has this huge orbit, goes way out and then comes back in again and then way out again. Uh, And uh, he started looking into it and kind of studied it for about 10 years, I guess. And then finally he said, "Uh uh-oh, we think we found it. Now, this is the Naval Astronomy, the um, actual planetarium observatory, if you will, for the United States Navy. And this guy ran it, okay? He called Sitchin in to his offices and sat uh, sat down with him. And I'm not sure off the top of my head, I have 10 million things in my feeble little mind here, but um, I don't have the exact dates, not important. I think it was 1990. And uh, uh, so Sitchin sits down with Harrington. Harrington says, I agree with you. I think that you're absolutely right. And uh, as soon as he said that, in a short period of time, he became ill and he died of cancer in about uh, whatever, uh, within a couple of years before he was able to complete his official report. Now, people, of course, could throw stones at that since the final report was never accomplished, but uh, we have the actual videotape of that meeting between Sitchin and Harrington when Dr. Harrington admitted he was right and they had found it. So some point in time, here's, and by the way, I have to say this also, I just throw this in. Every, and, I, and I'm going to use the word credible because it's hard to know if they are or not, but every one of the um, uh, people that were, would be called prophets 
that that were are any good. All right, the really best quote unquote prophets uh, going back a thousand years or five hundred years or seven or four or six, uh, all of them talk specifically about Nibiru, the planet com- the planet X coming back around, causing all of these uh, different problems, et cetera, et cetera. And it included uh, Mother Shipton from England 400 years ago that predicted uh, scuba diving, submarines, automobiles, tanks, harvesting equipment, generators, computer systems, all of that. Uh, and she also made a big deal about Planet X Nibiru coming back by and causing unbelievable havoc on the face of the globe. Nostradamus does the same thing. And my point, I guess, here is when you have all of the religions, eh, all the religious writings, even the monks on the top of the mountains in Tibet have the same stories, the same information related to the return of Nibiru. All right, now... Um, the and and there's also junk related. I'm not going to get into it too much. Um, uh, information junk's not a good term. Uh, information related to this also in the crop circles like crazy. Um, uh, you know all kinds of very specific uh, points of uh, of the Nibiru return. So finally, it made sense where all the money went. By the way, we now have 103 underground facilities. I have finished the DVD. It's a two, it's a double disc DVD. Um, It's 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 very tedious because I I was obligated, I thought, to give all of the interfacing connections of of in other words, connecting all of the dots from square one moving forward. It's a four-hour DV, two DVs of two hours each. It covers everything, the political part of it, the foreign part, uh, the secrecies, um, how they've been doing it, how they've been going about it, etc. But the bottom line is this, and some people will remember, 1983, Ronald Reagan did a speech on the floor of the United Nations and he said, I wonder how we will all react between each other. And he was talking to the Russians and the Chinese And at that time. He said, when we discovered some extraterrestrial threat, how well would we cooperate among each other once we found that there was an extraterrestrial threat headed towards Earth and, in fact, uh, we all had to join together? Well, that's exactly the period of time from my information, that uh, Ronald Reagan was presented with the fact that Nibiru was headed back in and gave him a fairly close estimate, if, uh, estimate is probably the, the best term, of uh, when, when it might in fact be, uh, be going to arrive. So now I'm going to shut up briefly anyhow. If you have any questions or anything like that, jump on right now. We've also had, by the way, an awful lot of important people at high levels of international government that had died uh, since this that may very likely have been privy to the information uh, of this planet headed back in and uh, that the upper crust bad guys uh, were maybe worried that they wouldn't keep their mouth shut, so they eliminated them. And, of course, that includes two or three of the heads of the CIA that had been retired. They were all killed. Uh, you know, they, whatever, they set them up and make look like they were physical problems or that they had, uh, in the Bill Colby's situation, they said, told us that he had fallen out of his canoe. Uh, and uh, I did a major investigation into his death. He was murdered, no question about it. Who knows why Princess Kelly, or or why, uh, excuse me, um, uh, what am I trying to say? I'm I'm having a, uh, uh, the uh, princess that was so uh, popular that died in the car. Diana? Uh, I'm sorry, Diana. Princess Diana. She may possibly have been one that fit into the category of 
knowing what was coming and people being worried that she would shoot her mouth off. So you have to understand something. A lot of people and, and a lot of people ask, uh, when are they going to tell us? When are they going to make an official announcement to the people that this thing is coming in? All right, that can never happen, and it will never happen. There will not be an, an official presentation that, oh, by the way, you know, uh, we'll call it a, you know, my my fellow countryman speech from the president. That's not going to happen. Now, if it does happen, let me rephrase it. It it may possibly happen, but when it does, the United States will already have to be under martial law. The entire country has to be under martial law before they make that presentation. And, of course, when they do make it, all those people that have their tickets to go underground are already going to be there. And this speech will be put out on a pre-recorded format to the rest of the world. Uh, they're going to be gone, and they don't want any interruption on their way down into the tunnels. All right. So um, uh, the bottom line is, my opinion is, they probably will never make that announcement official. But before it becomes visible in the sky, where people start saying, um, and you know, thousands of uh, just average folks, but also, of course, the uh, uh, amateur astronomers, before any of them get to where they can actually say, uh-oh, there's a new star. And then a, a week later, it's going to be a little bit bigger. You know, and then it's going to be a little bit bigger. And before that happens, and it starts becoming the talk of the of the Earth, we will be in martial law. That's where the equipment... Uh, the military equipment's been supplied going back to the 90s to the sheriffs and the police departments all around the world, I mean, excuse me, all around the United States, and con including things like grenade launchers, bazookas, personnel carriers, some of it uh, they talked about there in Missouri when they're having the uh, racial problems here recently, and they complained. They said, what's with the... What's with the police coming out with water cannons and personnel carriers and armored cars and all that? Where would that come from in, in Missouri, you know, um, because people hadn't paid attention, see? But uh, these things have been placed continuously since the 90s, and the only caveat, uh, the only um, extra little sidebar to it was that they would supply them for almost nothing. They could make long-term payments to the, you know, uh, to uh, for the leftover, quote-unquote, leftover military equipment that was being available, made available to these policing uh, operations. The only thing was they had to agree that if they were ever needed for a national emergency, quote-unquote, that they would come on board, you know, with whatever federal agency that requested their help and that they would use it appropriately you know and of course you know these these guys you know it's great these sheriffs getting you know 50 caliber machine guns on the top of a troop carrier for crying out loud you know in the north carolinas i mean they love that you know we'll soft sign anything what do i got to sign that's great you know get me a couple of those and a couple of a uh, few bazookas and a bunch of gas masks and yeah we want all that stuff so that's been going on like crazy uh and uh that's all going to be that's already in place all right that's all out there already uh and continuing to move uh so uh, that's and that's where all those thousands of bullets and everything to all these stupid little bureaucratic um uh, offices have signed off on thousands of uh, uh side arms and bullets and stuff like that uh, what, 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 what in the world would that be for? And there's so much that they've bo ordered, you could fight a third world war with the junk that they've put out and distributed across the uh, the police forces and the forestry department and that kind of junk, IRS. Uh, what's going on? Now, I also, sh to shift gears again, another fine point. I got looking into, uh, and by the way, I took three years creating these two DVDs. 
uh, and I won't tell you how many problems I had. They've been trying to cut this, shut this thing down profusely. My computer has been tapped as many as 3,000 times in a couple of years. So, um, uh, and anyhow, that's the side, a little nothing. I looked into the religious part of it. I thought, you know, the Pope, and at that level, all right, they got to be involved. And I started snooping, son of a gun, guess what? The the Vatican built an infrared telescope in Arizona, built and owned by the Vatican, owned and operated cooperatively by the United States government and NASA people, uh, and but it's owned by them. Um, and and uh, and by the way, guess what they called it? Lucifer. That's right mm-hmm. out of the Vatican. They own, named their own. Uh, infrared uh, telescope uh, Lucifer. Now, the the Planet X at this point in time can only really be photographed properly by very powerful uh, uh, infrared telescopes. Uh, it doesn't put out its own light, therefore it's, uh, it's something that's not simply seen easily. Theoretically, Planet X is five times the diameter of Earth. It carries along with it four or five uh, moons of its own, somewhat like a separate little solar system with um, uh, the, the, the bigger planet being what would represent the sun and, and then the moons around it. It's kind of like its own little solar system. Uh, the, um, uh, I'm trying to hit on a few of the more poignant... Oh, okay. I know a lot of people have heard about this. Some people haven't. But why would, if we didn't have something like this happening, why would the Centers for Disease Control order up and purchase over a half a million coffins designed exclusively, even including in the patents itself, designed exclusively to accommodate possibly two or three adults and designed specifically to be cremated? These are bought, ordered up, purchased, and delivered over two years ago to the Center for Disease Control. Um, something's wrong with that picture, folks. You've got to worry about that. Uh, the uh, other thing that people ask me, again, um, uh, maybe, maybe possibly being a little, a little bit um, uh, uh, repetitious, but it, um, a lot of people ask, uh, why why can't we just go out in the backyard and see it? Well, first off, it's way far off in terms of distance still. It is already affecting everything. The crazy weather that we have on the globe in the last two years, it can be, uh, I think, my opinion, along with people that have been, that are, on the scientific side of it, this I didn't come to this as a scientist, as an astronomer. Uh, you know, I have to go, I have to depend on people that have been doing it for years. Uh, some of this I discovered myself once I, I, I learned what was happening. Uh, for example, all of the planets have been changing, going from Pluto inward. All of the planets have been heating up, the surface chemistries have been altering. The, uh, there's having storms on the face of some planets. They've never seen that ever before. That's right. uh, the, some, some of the planets are wiggling, jumping around a little bit in their orbits. They're not quite sure what's going on with that. All right. Now, Planet X comes back from a distance out beyond the Oort cloud. And for people that are not familiar with that, and that would include myself three years ago. Uh, The Oort cloud is like a gigantic uh, circle of space debris uh, by in tremendous volume. I'm talking trillions and trillions of pieces, I guess, uh, of space debris that constitutes what they call a cloud named after the guy that discovered it, uh, named Oort. Uh, a German or a Yugoslavian or something like that. Anyhow, uh, it comes in from way out there. That Oort cloud, so that you get a handle on this, that Oort cloud surrounds the entire solar system that we are existing in. 
All right. So that's how big it is and how far out it is. All right. The Planet X is said to be returning from way out past that, coming back in. And when it travels, it's uh, uh, it's like a bowl. I refer it to like the bowling ball effect. It's like a bowling ball coming down the alley into the ten pins at the end of the alley. And as it goes into all of that debris and everything else on it, making its way on inward, it's affecting by gravitational effects and physical collision, etc. Uh, it's it's banging junk all over in every possible direction into the universe. Uh, we have had an increase in meteors and meteorites just in the last three, four years. I mean, and, and unless you're completely out of it, you can just watch the regular NBC, CBS News, and you can see every once in a while they say, oh, there was another uh, another meteor scene, and they'll show this ball of fire coming down over California. And then they'll say, oh, a week or two later, there's another one someplace else and someplace else and someplace. It's global. They're all over. They're coming in like crazy because they've been cultivated and smacked and and, and dislodged from where their normal little uh, homeland would be floating around in space because of this Nibiru coming back in with this whole little solar system of its own, heading back. The idea is, uh, now, there there are, in fact, uh, and I have to uh, kind of give credit and point out and uh, make a, a real important point here, Th there are a couple of different points of view uh, whether Nibiru will come back in on on our plane we are on what's called the plane of the ecliptic, which is somewhat uh, all of the planets reasonably on a flat plane. If you put your arm out uh, away from your body, if you put your arm out flat straight out, uh, the, the plane of ecliptic that we are rotating on in our orbit and all of the other planets on their orbits is all pretty much reasonably on that flat plane. Now, if you go down, move your hand downward about 12 or 8 inches, that would represent approximately a 30-degree uh, slant off from a straight arm, a straight point where your arm would be out straight. That would be about a 30-degree uh, off of the ecliptic. Now, the half of the people think that it will be coming in pretty close to flat plane. Uh, the rest of them think it's going to come in at about 30 degrees to uh, to the, the uh, from from below us and 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 cutting through sort of like cutting through a pie but cutting through on that 30 degree angle coming up around the sun and then back out again on that angle. Either one doesn't make any difference to me. My point, of course, is just if the darn thing's coming and it's going to you know create all the problems that it will create. Uh, so uh, you, you do have a difference of opinion of, of people that are on both sides of the fence equally as intelligent and schooled on astronomy as each other, but uh, talking about slight differences on, uh, on that. Now, it would make a difference of how long we would be affected. Um, and again, I, I, and I must point out there's a... Uh, a a fellow named Gil Broussard has done a tremendous amount of study on this uh, himself for many years. He's matched up all the dates of when it previously had come by um, and, and caused problems uh, there. And again, this is where you have two different um, thought factors here. One one um, one group uh, also feels that it's which which Dr. Sitchin originally said when he did the Sumerian tablets, he said it was a 3,600-year orbit, 1,800 years out and then 1,800 years back, all right? Um, and that would mean, of course, that it would only come around every 3,600 years. Now, Gil Broussard uh, feels that it has been coming around every 360 or 350 years. Now, that means it would be coming around 10 times in that 3,600-year orbit. 
Now, originally, I thought, being a co- totally a novice in, in this stuff anyhow, um, uh, I thought, wow, 3,600 years, that's a really a long orbit. Uh, you know, does that even make physical sense? You know, how come it doesn't fly apart uh, in that period of time, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but then I, I realized uh, that we had, uh, we had a comet. Everybody's familiar with Halley's Comet. Now, Halley's Comet comes around every 75 years. Um, and uh, then I realized that there was another comet that came around a little while back, and I think seen, discovered in the 60s or something like that, uh, that actually was on a, it was called the Hale-Bopp Comet. And it came around a few years ago, had never been seen before, was not logged in any place. And it was pretty good size, just like Halley's Comet. And uh, it was a 4,200-year orbit. See, so that's that's a 1,000 almost, 700, 800 years longer than the 3,600 that was perceived for Planet X. So that long orbit is a reality. That's all I'm saying. It actually, they now as it is, this uh, particularly hale bopp comet, comet will not be coming around for another 4,000 years, so we don't have to worry about that. And, of course, it was just a comet. And the difference here is we're talking potentially a physical planet the size of five times Earth. It supposedly passed through the last time. There has been writings on this. Again, I go back to antiquity, all over the place describing the the last passing of this thing. If it was 360 years ago, or if it was 3,600 years ago, it makes no difference the United States elite criminal personalities at the top of our government have stolen the money, built a hundred of these underground facilities and filled them up, not with foodstuffs, for 50 years from today. Why are they having them completed last year and this year and four years ago all over America, keeping them top secret, spending all the every buck they could steal, including the gold, all of that money going down underground, if they do not perceive this to be coming back in a short period of time, period. Now, let me leave this open now to you guys. You've got any questions, uh, more than 700 of them, uh, uh, please go ahead and ask. And if I can answer it, I will. And if I can't, I'll just tell you I don't know. Oh, great. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, this has been uh, unbelievable. You have touched upon every major point that, um, you know, I, I can – I mean, wow. Thank God. Um, and, and I'll share some things with you, and then I'll also uh, pass over a couple of questions that some people had sent in. Um, <clears throat> what's fascinating is that when you look at, if you were to make yourself a model of the solar system, uh, of our solar system, and then create a second model of another solar system, bigger, smaller, doesn't really matter, and you would and you would take the two models and you would slowly move them toward one another and then uh and, and and move them past one another in an elliptical orbit which is arguably what this is supposed to be in if you were to move if you were to create that model and move the nibiru system through our solar system and in an elliptical orbit and back out again what you would end up with is two events not one but two events. And what's fascinating is the Bible actually explains those two events in rather vivid detail in in a couple of verses. In the in in the sixth seal, at the sixth seal in Revelation chapter six, verse fourteen, you have uh an event that's along the lines of the Velikovsky type stuff, uh, which is similar to uh the Edgar Casey vision, uh where it says in Revelation six fourteen it says every island and mountain was moved out of place. What's fascinating yes. is that matches 
similarly to what Father Malachi Martin testified on uh, Coast to Coast AM in 1998, I believe it was, where he said he was given the third secret of Fatima by some insiders and that there was supposedly a pole shift in the third secret and it was supposed to happen in 2017. Now, if, okay. the, if, 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 if Nibiru the system moves through our ecliptic plane and comes back on the uh, elliptical orbit through again a second time. Uh, what's fascinating is about three years later, arguably, because the Great Tribulation of the Bible is about three and a half years long, okay, Revelation 6, I'm sorry, Revelation 16, verse 20, in contrast to Revelation 6:14 says every island fled away and the mountains were not found. So what you Absolutely. have in Yep, so then you have a dynamic in Revelation 16 uh verse 20 that is very similar to what you see in the movie 2012 where the uh where the crust of the earth completely gave way and entire continents were destroyed. And um and it's that's fascinating because the timeline just seems to follow suit with with an elliptical orbit of of a star system moving through our uh uh solar system. One of the questions that someone had submitted was have you heard any word uh you know in your in your uh from people in your sources and such about sure. Puerto Rico something happening in Puerto Rico FEMA coffins stockpiles of emergency supplies things like that anything associated with Puerto Rico there is a prophet by the name of Ephraim yes. Rodriguez who's talking about a comet or an asteroid splashing down off the coast of Puerto Rico what do you know about that um okay um uh, yes i know that uh, the the reality is that a huge amount of uh, uh maybe even a, either a secondary order or the bulk of that first order of at least a half a million of those coffins i referred to um uh, have been moved for storage there i do know that a couple of million body bags were ordered up and have ended up there in terms of a storage. Now, I don't know if, in fact, uh, I don't. Th first off, I don't believe there's any way anybody at this point in time could say uh, X Y Z is going to uh, hit into the waters close there or something of that sort. I don't know personally. My gut feeling overall uh, is that. Uh, that probably would be a lousy place, but for some reason, temporarily, uh, yes, that's a truism. That stuff is down there, or at least some of it, uh, and in big numbers. Uh, that's all I can say as far as that's concerned. Um, I'm not, not positive of, uh, about if anybody would have the ability to get close enough to say. And, and besides, here's the other point. If um, we, we saw a tsunami in uh, a couple of years ago and we, we we witnessed that and it was unbelievable and that was way that was from an earthquake way way far out in the ocean uh these tsunamis that would be set up <clears throat> and generated from a large let's say something the size of a school bus anything the size of like a school bus that went into any of the oceans on the earth will set up tsunamis that will just would be shocking uh, to almost every coastline east and west away from the center point. Uh, it, it only takes something that big if it's coming in uh, at the speed that these uh, would, would be coming in. We witnessed one, and now this is another important point as people relate to why can't we see these things, et cetera. First off, it's not close enough. Uh, but secondarily, we have to remember something that we saw right in front of our face, and that was the meteor that we were watching and waiting for a, um, uh, a meteor right or a meteor to come in uh, that we were aware of that was going to come in over Russia a couple of years ago. And then on the same day, a secondary, which apparently had no connection to the first one, a, second, uh, a secondary one came in and blew up really violently and blew like 2,000 windows out in Russia and, and injured a whole bunch of people, et cetera. It was like a big bomb going off 
uh, in the atmosphere. It actually did burn up and explode. Most of it did before it even hit. And when it hit, it went into a lake that was ice covered and it was only the biggest piece, I think, that went into the lake was only about 15 feet across or something. But fortunately, just went into uh, into a, a lake uh, covered with ice. But every everybody right away said, where did that come from? Nobody on the face of the earth saw that thing coming in. No one. And when the head of NASA was asked about it a while later, uh, he simply said, it came in from the direction of the sun, and we could not see it. We did not, and we could not see it with any of our scopes. Okay. Um, and then also, by the way, he was asked if one, if a large uh, uh, element was coming towards Earth, and we knew it was coming in 60 days, what could we do? And the head of NASA said, pray. So um, that was the best uh, uh, preventative action that the head of NASA had for that question. But I want to get into another point, make another point. Now, what you're talking about is all, and again, it is all in the Bible. Not only is it in the Bible, it, but it's, it's all over the place. You know, uh, you have to, you know, you maybe have to do a little snooping, but now what you can do is simply get my DVD uh, and and I have all of that in here. I've got all the biblical connections, the dates, the elements, the descriptions, all of it. It's all in my DVD. Now, in 1999, there was a discovery made in Germany. And uh, it was called, they end up calling it the Sky Disc. This is a, um, uh, found at an archaeological dig in Germany, set up very similar to the Stonehenge in England, a big circular thing, and it was there during the Bronze Age, and uh, approximately 3,000 years ago, uh, and it apparently was literally some type of a sky observatory in the Bronze Age. So we had some people, you know, they they were really into what's going on in the sky, uh, you know, like the Egyptians going way far back, and this thing that's called the sky disk. It's approximately 12 to 13 inches across. It's circular, like a shield, so to speak. Um, but it's a piece of art, if you will. But it actually is a diary of the passing of Nibiru, causing a, a solar eclipse during a particular day when this happened. Now, well, could that be the three uh, days of darkness that everybody's talking about, do you think? Oh, the actually, three days well, of yes, but, but this was um, actually, according to this, it appears that it was only seven hours. But you have to understand, uh, th there are a lot of other things involved, like debris and junk and everything, coming along behind this thing. Now, that's where we're going to have real problems. Let me, because let me there, the reason what, I'm asking, because sure, I'd love yes, to hear sir. your thoughts on this, because there are prophecies. There's a Padre Pio prophecy from 1950, 1951, uh, which includes three days of darkness uh, that are supposed to be coming upon the earth. And then, of course, you have the reference in Revelation 6, uh, verse uh, 12, where it says the, uh, the sun turns black as sackcloth of hair. Well, it doesn't give the duration, but certainly if the sun turns black, yes. it's going to be pretty darn dark. So the question yes. is, if it does turn out to be a three days of darkness dynamic, which which matches uh, the three days of darkness during uh, the Passover and Exodus, uh, then, then my goodness, uh, could, do you think it could be related to the passing of this thing? Oh, absolutely. And I'll, let me explain and hit on all these things real quick, too, and because I don't want to run out. How much time we got? We got a little bit of time. Yeah, yeah we're about, yep. Okay, well, when, when do we wrap up? Eight? Uh, eight yeah, uh, in about eight ten minutes. Yeah, we got oh, okay. about, prob right. probably I, ought to shoot I, I, for about eight minutes. <laughs> All right, let me scoot through this thing real quick. This star, star what's called the sky disk, it's, it's uh, in, uh, made of bronze. Uh, I believe it was literally poured, as a matter of fact. Uh, they were pouring bronze back then, and that's pretty amazing. But anyhow, they were making weapons and all by pouring them into molds. So they had to make a mold and then pour it. I believe this was poured. It is in bronze, 12, 13 inches across, circular, and highlighted uh, in gold. The whole thing, all the planets, and uh, everything indicated on the disk 
uh, is in, in gold. Now, here's the point. The, um, uh, the location, a couple of things showed up in this. One is uh, the different constellations that they very specifically have been able to identify are all on there in gold. The moon, the, excuse me, the sun is there. The earth, the earth, is, or the earth is shown uh, from, from the point of view of where they were watching this. Uh, and the, uh, the moon and the sun are both seen at the same time. All right, uh, and so it, it indicates uh, with the location of the constellations, et cetera, with new computerization programs, they have put in the locations and they have come up with a date. This thing was made uh, 3,600 years ago. Wow. And it indicates, yes, and it indicates the, uh, a solar eclipse by a large body Obviously not by the moon, because the moon can be seen. Uh, additionally, um, let's see. Well, that's the most important point, I guess. Now, how this would have been din done, obviously, was uh, this uh, astronomer. I've got to call him an astronomer. These people that built this uh, huge observatory in the, gr in the ground there uh, to, to mark off the movements of the sky, they were blown away by this event. What it also shows, and this is important because this was, as a matter of fact, Gil Bruchard came up with most of this and it's brilliant study, unbelievable in-depth study relating the biblical, uh, biblical statements to all of these events. But it shows that what took place when this came by, it shifted the earth 26 degrees. They can literally, with the new computerization, they feed the information that's shown on this down to not only the, the year, but the day, and it was 8.30 in the morning when this took place. That's how accurate the computerization is of the description given on the disk. So they actually have a date and a time, etc. Now, that 26 shifting of the entire axis because of this passing of Nibiru, now that refers to what you're talking about, the movement of mountains and all the rest of that. Now, you get into another thing where you talk about, uh, the, and by the way, it was about a seven-hour eclipse, if I recall right. Again, this is off the top of my, my head here, and uh, it, it, I have it all exact in my DVD, but I think that's what it was, um, which, of course, is a long time. Holy mackerel, you know, if you're talking in the middle of the day, you lose uh, uh, several hours of it, uh, not, not just 15, um, uh, you know, a couple of uh, few minutes, so to speak. Um, anyhow, uh, it, it was several hours as opposed to a few minutes of a, of a solar eclipse because of this being this giant planet going by. Now, here's what's going to happen. If everything happens as it's being perceived, taking historic writings, biblical accounts, all the rest of that, and mixing it with scientific reality and the size and all the rest of those calculations. This guy is going to come in. Now, when it comes in to go around the sun, and again, dragging with it a couple of moons, about four or five moons, it's also going to have uh, a, uh, a tail behind it of meteoric junk. All right, just space junk dragging along behind it. That's when we're going to go through. It will take the Earth approximately one hour to travel through the width of the tail of that. After it's gone behind the sun, we will, our, our orbit will drag us through it in a worst-case situation through the tail. It will take an hour to pass through it. During that hour, we will be going through a hailstorm of meteors, burning hail, which is described in the Bible, okay? That's what killed all these soldiers and all sorts of things, et cetera, described very, uh, very specifically in the Bible. 
Uh, oh, absolutely. Will... Revelation 6.13 says, And the stars from the heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Um, we're down to the five-minute mark. Um, I'd love to have you tell people where they can go to get your DVD set in a little bit more detail. I'm looking at your website right now, and I don't see the link for it. It says Home About Media Videos. Where can people go, go to get this okay, DVD set? You... Okay, if you go to to and you 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 have uh, at least there if you if you're well, are you just on Google? It, here's the point. Just just go on Bob Fletcher Investigations dot com. It's Bob Fletcher Investigations dot com or the Bob Fletcher Investigations one long word dot com. You will get to my uh, you'll get to my my website. On the website, uh, there's a description. There's some pictures of underground facilities, a few things in there. But the uh, the title of the uh, disc, or excuse me, the uh, double DVD disc set is Incoming. That's the title of it. Uh, we we can uh, you can get it easily. I've got a, a section in there. Called, I guess it's under store. I don't get involved with that too much, but I guess it's under store um, or, or you know where to purchase or whatever. You can find it on there. You can't miss it. And by the way, I have to uh, tell you something. Uh, I, I've did, done a, a couple of radio programs that uh, uh, were are fair, fairly large in their following, and uh, the uh, the reaction uh, has been mind-boggling. People are really understanding the seriousness of this. Now, I want to get in real quick. Uh, I do give you an, an estimate of all of these professionals of when we might see this. And it's interesting because you talk about Passover and the relationship to uh, the biblical statements on this uh, crazy thing. Um, the estimate is that uh, possibly by next December, the star will be seen first up in the sky, that the uh, planet X will be seen as a star. The wow. earliest time, earliest time has been calculated to be next December and for it to pass by March and April. Wow. Of the next of the very 90 days later, uh, the Passover. Uh, the That would be the very earliest. The very latest would be any one of the other following two or three years. In other words, it'll be seen in December, and then within 90 days it'll pass by. Uh, that's when the problem that hits the fan. It will constitute um, uh, blocking the sun by with the, not only itself, but by all the debris and junk, plus the volcanic activity. As we yep. speak today, the volcanic, volcanic activity on the Earth is amazing. A couple of weeks ago, it was 37 of them at one time was going off. Nobody's talking much about that, but it's in reality. You can, you know, you can look up the activity and what have you. Um, it will cause volcanoes. Uh, it will cause tsunamis that will be mind-boggling. The gravitational effect, we have to remember, and I get into this also in the DVD, I have to remember that the moon pulls our, our waters in and out all the time with the tides, okay? Uh, this, this thing is five times the size of Earth. The gravitational effect would be mind-boggling to our, all of the oceans and the, the uh, coastlines. So it's a, a multitude of problems. And the 2012, the title 2012 motion picture that you saw that was created in 2010, I am afraid is a very, very close to what we're talking about with Nibiru. Amen. Praise of... God. And we are down to the one sixty second mark. Um, thank you so much, Bob. Uh... Those folks don't know me. I got involved totally non-intentionally. Um, I had a company, was taken over. I merged. It's not taken over. It's not, well, yeah, maybe that is the right word. I merged my company with another company in Atlanta, Georgia, in 1985 or 86, that period of time. And it turned out to be 
run and operating by a covert central intelligence national security operative who supplies weapons for all of the small wars that we re you referred to just a few minutes ago around the world um, that have been taking place. Uh, this was a central intelligence operation. They took over my business to use it as a covert front. And then, and again, it's totally unknown to myself. There's no way of knowing that until you're already into it. Uh, once I had signed papers and merged, and a few months into it, uh, then I started meeting all of these uh, military generals and officers and covert operatives and uh, 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 Lieutenant Colonel Bo Greitz at that time. is a good friend of mine uh, at this point in time. At that time, I met him uh, when he had just come back from doing uh, covert uh, operations looking for prisoners of war, and that was in 86, that period of time. Uh, and they were still... Um, uh, Bo was still bringing uh, and getting uh, prisoners of war out of the old Vietnam War. Uh, and uh, these people, of course, who I'm talking about that supply the weapons for all these small wars uh, make multi, multi millions of dollars. And, of course, they also end up being involved with drug smuggling, Oliver North and all of that, Iran, Contra. <laughs> Bob Fletcher, are you there? Yes, sir, I sure am. Can well, you hear we me? Are, yes, we can hear you great. And we're just we That's just want to hear everything you're willing to share with us tonight. Um we we have actually played audio bites from your recent visit uh to InfoWars with Alex Jones and we, we had noticed and I know that you did too that uh that Alex is very uncomfortable with the Planet X subject. <laughs> yes, he is. But then again, you know, the bottom line is, first off, it's very scary stuff, uh, you know, and, and I would wish that I was wrong, but I don't believe I am. Uh, and, of course, the bottom line is simply, you know, when this planet would approach really close or fairly close, that doesn't have to get, ter you know, terribly close to our backyard, but once it passes by, uh, everything hits the fan. But what happens with... An awful lot of people, and, that, and it's all right because it's totally understandable. The bottom line, like with Alex. Now, Alex, <clears throat> Alex literally had used to, he introduced me most of the times when I was on his program. He would introduce me as the one guy that actually persuaded him to go full-time into the radio, uh, the radio talk show business, period, Bob Fletcher. Uh, and then he used to follow that with a caveat and say that uh, everything Bob has ever found out or discovered or exposed has turned out to be 100% right. And he used to say, listen to Bob Fletcher. Jones with you, you opened my eyes. Well, <clears throat> thank you. I greatly appreciate that. And and what I probably should do is, and I have to do this very briefly because uh, I've been doing it so long and my personal story is so complex and what have you that, but but I, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. But for the people that do not know who I am, they can go, of course, to my website, which is BobFletcherInvestigations.com. Now, if you just go on Google and put in Bob Fletcher, uh, you'll end up there also because um, I get I'm kind of like all over the place there, like a sort of like a bad fungus, I guess, but. Uh, uh, at least to the uh, to the bad guys in government. Um, so as a matter of fact, I I had to quote uh, Senator Kerry, John Kerry, who's now of course Secretary of State. I had assisted his offices profusely many years ago in one of the inquiries relative to drugs and government officials, and um, I had just run for the United States Congress in 1990, and uh, he asked me uh, what. If I, and matter of fact, I almost took that seat. But he asked me, uh, what what would have happened if I had taken the the seat and become the, uh, up there in Congress? And I jokingly said, well, I would be the biggest pain in the butt that they ever had in Washington. 
and uh, Senator Kerry's um, uh, response there was that he said, I got news, you already are one of the biggest pains in the butts in Washington. And that was, of course, back in 1990. That's a long time ago. But uh, it's one of the best best things I ever heard out of um, a senator's mouth out of Washington, D.C., that I was already causing them uh, uh, more grief than they wanted to, to uh, share. But uh, for those because he's never been wrong. And, of course, now I've been doing this pursuit of corrupted people in government for 30 years. All right, so that's why you go back to when Alex was still in school and listening and watching my, my exposés himself. Now, that was the way he introduced me. But uh, the day um, uh, that I talked about uh, the incoming of Nibiru, um, he was freaked out. He um, uh, and the and the bottom line is this: uh, he's scared. It's an internal thing. I'm not going to say that it's financial. I believe it's totally an an internal, personal thing with him. And and the concept, the things I was talking about, are, are very frightening. And some people, um, you know, are just not going to buy into it until it's uh, you know until it's a a, a vivid in your backyard, it's all over kind of a situation. And uh, up to that point, there are many people, including Alex, uh, that, that are just um, uh, frightened off by this. Now, what I, w- I, was I would throw, like to... Uh, yes, we, go ahead. I, yes. I wanted to get uh, Dr. Beer. Kenneth, Kenneth Beer is with us. Uh, he's, our, he, he's, he, he's been doing the radio show here with us now since all the way back to 2011 when we started it. And uh, he's really familiar with your work uh, all the way back to WWCR uh, and Shortwave Patriot Radio. And, and, and uh, Kenneth worked with Bill Cooper in Kaji back in the 90s. Kenneth, say hello. Hey, Bob, it's it's good to actually hear you on the show. I remember hearing you years ago on Patriot Broadcast Networks and various uh, uh, forums, and it's it's amazing that you're actually on the show now. So I'm all ears tonight, and I can't wait to hear what you're going to share, but I've followed you for so long, and I'm kind of like Alex Jones. Business. I was a witness in that, and then became, because of it, chasing peop- those people, uh, one, of course, leads to another. I became involved with at least eight to ten very serious top-level um, uh, investigations at the congressional level. Now, I also have to add that absolutely none of them go any place. They are all complete garbage for the television for the most part and to get senators and congressmen reelected because they show you all the wonderful things they were trying to do to clean up America, and in most cases it's all garbage. Now, put that aside, that's how I got involved with this stuff of chasing and following, going after criminal people, criminal personalities at the highest levels of our government, all the way up to the White House, and it's nonpartisan. Uh, They're crooks, liars, and thieves on both sides of the fence, Anybody that goes up there as an honest congressman, and I will use Sonny Bono as a perfect example, a guy, anybody that gets in there and goes and ends up getting into the Senate and the Congress, that basically at the very beginning, they kind of pull you aside and have a little meeting with you, which basically means um, uh, that if you come up here and cause a lot of grief, you'll not be back here again for a second term. If you come up and you uh, cooperate, things will run really smooth, and you can move up to the highest levels in our government uh, if you're a good guy. Uh, From their point of view, a good guy is somebody that keeps their mouth shut regardless of what they see. And in Sonny's case, um, top-level investigations at the congressional level. Now, I also have to add that absolutely none of them go any place. They are all complete garbage for the television for the most part. And to get senators and congressmen reelected because they show you all the wonderful things they were trying to do to clean up America. And in most cases, it's all garbage. Now, put that aside. That's how I got involved with this stuff of chasing and following, going after criminal people, criminal personalities 
at the highest levels of our government, all the way up to the White House, and it's nonpartisan. Uh, they're crooks, liars, and thieves on both sides of the fence. Anybody that goes up there as an honest congressman, and I will use Sonny Bono as a perfect example, a guy, anybody that gets in there and goes and ends up getting into the Senate and the Congress, that basically at the very beginning they kind of pull you aside and have a little meeting with you, which basically means um, uh, that if you come up here and cause a lot of grief, you'll not be back here again for a second term. If you come up and you uh, cooperate, things will run really smooth, and you can move up to the highest levels in our government uh, if you're a good guy. Uh, from their point of view, a good guy is if somebody that keeps their mouth shut regardless of what they see. And in Sonny's case, he was appalled when he got up into the, the den of thieves in Washington and realized how unbelievably criminal everybody was up there. Uh, and uh, there's many, many wonderful stories, but we don't have time to get into those this evening. But uh, nonetheless, uh, Sonny, I bring him up because uh, when he and I, I worked with Sonny supplying him with information on and documentation, uh, the best that you can possibly get, uh, supplied him with reams and reams of information related to the central intelligence involvement and other agencies, uh, embassies and everybody else, with the drug smuggling, murder, and assassinations. Uh, when I worked with him supplying material, probably it was probably over a year, uh, and then, then got down to uh, really sharpening pencils, and uh, finally they... Uh, his, his office called me back and told me that um, uh, as soon as Sonny got back from the Christmas holidays, the first thing on the calendar was the investigation at the congressional intelligence level with all of my material and some material supplied by other people. They wanted to make sure I was ready to come back into Washington. I was living in Los Angeles at the time. Was I ready to come back? and make sure that I had all of my stuff with me and that I assist them in bringing in other witnesses, which included drug smugglers and everybody you can imagine, that was going to come forward to a brand-new congressional investigation and for one of the first times in the history of congressional inquiries, Sonny's offices in, informed me that they had subpoena powers, so they were going to be able to force people to come in and force them to either answer questions or they actually could put them in jail until they decided to cooperate. That never happens normally in any of these inquiries. You know, these guys can go in and sit down and then they say, oh, I don't remember, or I can't come in right now, I'm doing something else, or this or that, whatever, and they sidestep the serious questions. That wasn't going to happen on this inquiry. And uh, I loved it. I was I was overwhelmed with joy, and uh, I thought, oh my God, this is going to be one of the first times we're going to be able to nail people right to the wall with with unbelievable criminal activities coming right out of the White House uh, and going up that far. And ten days later, Sonny Bono was murdered on the top of the ski slopes in mm. in uh, Nevada. Of course, they told everybody, everybody can remember, they had this, this traumatic uh, uh, announcement that Sonny had uh, crashed into a tree and died from running into a tree with his skis on. And, of course, nobody knew, because this has been kept very much undercover, the, uh, the, uh, the putting together this investigation. You know, somebody, nobody knew that at all. And, of course, here I'm sitting in Los Angeles, uh, I almost, uh, I don't know, I almost, I could have fallen off of my sofa, I guess, uh, when I saw the news. When I called back into his offices, uh, like a day later, day or two afterwards, nobody, they wouldn't take my calls. And I thought, now this is a, the fellow in, the, the, the gentleman that ran the office basically for Sonny uh, was a guy I had been close with. You know, we had lunch when I was in, um, 
Washington and what have you. Uh, as a matter of fact, one time when I had gone to Washington about two years ahead of this period of time, maybe maybe a year ahead, um, I was in Washington to see to stop in there. I stopped in uh, along with other activities I had there, and uh, uh, Frank, his name Frank Cullen, he came out and he said, uh, I, I looked into the office and they were had tapes up and they were blocking people off and and he came out and he said we gotta we we'll have to go down to the restaurant we can't come in uh, and I said what what's going on because people were up on the desks and there was powder all over the place from the ceiling and they were climbing around doing all sorts of stuff they had electronic equipment three or four technicians wandering around in Sonny's offices in the Congress building. And I said, what is going on? And they said, uh, Frank said, that they, somebody's been tapping our entire offices. And Now, read my lips, right? Tapping the offices of a congressman in the congressional buildings, in his mm-hmm. office buildings. And I said, what in the world? I said, well, you know, that doesn't surprise me what, what we're doing, what we're in the middle of right now. And, of course, that would have been at the very beginning of uh, when I was supplying them with the uh, information that I'm referring to uh, of uh, drug operations and what have you. So anyhow, the bottom line is um, uh, that's the kind of stuff I've been involved with, and literally I am afraid. I feel it has really devastated me. I feel that Sonny was murdered because of the material that I had supplied him, uh, had supplied him with, and uh, and the invest- investigation that was in fact uh, uh, on, re- ready to be cranked up. As soon as he got back, it was the first thing on the menu. Probably would have taken another, oh maybe f- probably 15 days uh, by the time uh, after the first of the year, uh, and uh, we would have been up there, uh, and it would have been devastating. I have live. Audio and I have live videos of um, uh, Kuhn, one of the, uh, uh, the biggest biggest drug smugglers in the world out of Burma or five years ago. So that was what had happened. That was what had created my original uh, lifestyle, if you will, uh, and keeping me in this junk. So now we, let's get back to all the crazy stuff going on underground. I had somebody came to me and said. You know, uh, the, these underground facilities, they're, uh, they're all over the United States, but to add to it, uh, they're doing it all over the world, and the major nations of the world are doing a similar thing, building these underground hideouts. And they, uh, you know, they said, you know, well, let me, let me show you this in Russia. Let me show you what they're doing in China. Let me show you this. So... Then I started thinking, what in the world's going on? All of a sudden, these criminals have been stealing millions for their own pockets. Now they shifted gears, and they're stealing billions and billions, adding up to trillions, and they're building underground hideouts. And and then I looked into it, and I found out that they were filling them with survival foods by the tons Tons and tons and tons of underground facilities being filled with tons and tons of um, survival dried foods and goods and material. Then I found out they had some facilities where they were growing, had set up underground growing operations so that they could grow actually foodstuffs in certain of these underground facilities. Then I found out about a thing called the International Seed Vault. Now that's not terribly secret. But basically, it's it's up in Norway, and it was goes into the granite the side of a granite frozen mountain in Norway, uh, kind of on an island, if you will, um, highly secured, totally secret entrances only with with military guards, etc. But they have seeds to regenerate all living foodstuffs on the face of the earth, if in fact. All of those things were eliminated. If all of a sudden everything was wiped out and we had to replant, we have multi millions of seeds in the Norway International Seed Vault. 
Oh, wow, that's pretty strange. All right, so now I'm adding all this stuff up. And then someone comes to me. Oh, and by the way, the Russians, in 2010, they put out a mandate for themselves internally to build and create ten, excuse me, 5,000 underground emergency shelters. That was in 2010. Their, their uh, mandate was to accomplish that by 2013. That was a targeted date. Uh, they did complete them for the most part. One of them's, most of them are small. They're not, what I'm talking, they're not eight or 10,000 people to get underground. They're, they're smaller facilities. But one of them can handle over 60,000 people underground wow. in Russia. All right? So, um, and then, like I said, we have these, uh, and then China, China's been doing the same thing. Uh, they have, and these are dug with these gigantic digging tunnel boring uh, machines that are so large, uh, the bigger ones, they can punch, uh, go a couple of miles a day into the side of a mountain, and when they're done, back out, and you could drive an eight, 18 wheeler down you know, where they've been. Uh, that's it. Just punch a big hole, come back out, and you could drive an 1800, uh, excuse me, an 18 wheeler facility into the side of a mountain or underground. So that's how they're built in terms of the the basic drilling of these things. The Red Chinese have one of the one single drill that is three of them in tandem, big enough so that they go into the side of a mountain, pull it out. And two 18-wheelers can go side by side, uh, driving uh, into or under the ground with these facilities. So the next point, obviously, was what in the world, what is the possible reason for this kind of expenditure of funds? And, and by the way, see, if anybody wants to know, everybody ever scratch their head and say, um, how come they don't fix 50,000 bridges and tunnels and what have you in the United States of America, all of our infrastructure, they haven't spent a penny on that stuff in 30 years. We have bridges today with a million cars going over it every day into major cities that, that technically should be condemned. You know, and the numbers of that, by the way, and of course, all this stuff. You know, a guy can individually look up on the on your computers. You want to find about? Uh, just put something in your computer on Google, like um, uh, infra infrastructure problems in America, and put that up, and you see the figures. It'll blow your mind. But they're not doing anything. They're not doing anything on any of that stuff. The money is not there. Where is all the money? The money is underground in these hideouts for the elite. They then also spent in the last few years millions and millions of dollars buying military equipment for the police and the sheriffs and for security operations, bullets, machine guns, under the title of, um, how about the uh, forest rangers with 15... Uh, uh, a million bullets uh, purchased under their name. You know, uh, the um, uh, not only Forest Ranger, how about the Internal Revenue Service? Thousands of bullets and machine guns and that type of stuff. All right? So we say, well, what, well what's that got to do with it, Bob? Well, it has to do with social riot control up on the top of the ground when the elite are down under the ground. And then finally it came to me, uh, exactly, I don't remember what the what it was, uh, but maybe I told some people I was looking into all these different things, and somebody simply said, uh, well, you know, Nibiru, Planet X, has been finally really discovered, and it's coming back. So then I started doing some snooping, because I didn't even know what they were talking about. And I said, you know, I said, oh, yeah, I remember something about that. And back, as a matter of fact, in the 50s and the 60s, it was like in Look Magazine, Reader's Digest, and for all of our young people out there, these were um, uh, big 
important magazines in the United States that were better than most of the newspapers. And they had done stories about Planet X in the early 50s and 60s. But at that time, they said, even if it was really found and located, don't worry about it because it's 50 or 60 years from now, right? Uh Uh-oh. Guess what, guys? It's 50 or 60 years since they wrote those stories, okay? So now is the time you do start worrying about it. Somebody brought to my attention a fellow named Zacharias pulled out his records and um, uh, it was videotaped by Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel Bo Greitz. He, he actually videotaped it when Kuhn saw, this is a drug smuggler in Burma that was the primary supplier of opiates into the free world for many years. He had 40,000 soldiers on the mountainside in Burma. Uh, so this is not like five guys, you know, mi- mixing funny white powder down in Mexico someplace. This is a huge operation with truckloads of the opiates coming out of uh, the top of the hill in Burma. And he had live, which I supplied to Sonny, live recorded videos of Kunsa's entire distribution leadership in Chinese with their books. They opened their books up going back many, many years, naming the central intelligence and ambassadorial uh, level persons that had bought the drugs and set up the financing with the, with the mafia, et cetera, et cetera, read their names live out of the books on the hillside in China, in Burma. And uh, that's the kind of evidence I had supplied, along with documentation and what have you, connecting right into people like uh, Richard Armitage, who was uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense for the United States of America under the Bush administration. Anyhow, that's the type of stuff I'd been doing. So now let's figure out how that relates to the incoming of the possibility of uh, Nibiru headed back in close to the uni- to the to the Earth. Uh, what had happened uh, a few years ago? I got looking into the extraordinary amount of money that was disappearing from the United States. Um, now, I, I, originally, I, I, I got to actually admit I didn't know anything about Planet X. I, you know, I had heard about it. It's one of those things, like so many millions of things, you hear about stuff, but then if it doesn't move to the forefront or you're not directly involved with it, like in my case, if you if you're not directly involved with it, it you know, it's it's like just just sort of out there, you know, and nobody could. No, there was no real good evidence uh, as far as I was concerned um, many, many years ago to ever pay any attention to it. But uh, when I started looking into the money that was disappearing, now what am I talking about? For one thing I'm talking about is that all the gold in Fort Knox is gone. It no longer exists. It has been taken, stolen, removed. All right. Now, when I say all of it... Um, whatever maybe i'm maybe i'm talking about you know 97% of it or whatever uh there's always enough a couple of roomfuls of gold that people could look at uh but that wouldn't mean anything because if you didn't see all of it or you didn't have an an accounting of it an audit of all of it uh, you know it really doesn't mean anything uh you know we have the big building in Fort Knox that's supposedly filled with it uh, and then, of course, we have it in New York City and a couple of major banks. They have some of it put away and, uh, you know, behind bars, if you will. And you could go there and probably still see some. Uh, they still have it in, in a few other locations. But for the most part, when you're talking tons, tons of gold in gold bullion, um, uh, tons and tons of it like there was at one point in time, uh, that's not there anymore. That's just gone. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, about in 2010 or 11, whenever it was, after the financial banking crash around the world, the global pinch, 
all right, that affected everybody, 2008, 9, 10, that period of time, um, the the banks or the those banking entities from Germany and a few other places, they came forward over here to the Federal Reserve and they said, we need a couple of tons of our gold. They have all those nations around the world have deposited their gold, the huge amounts of their gold, at the Fort Knox vaults as a security situation because some of the nations are, are, have always been a little shaky since World War II, and they worried basically about uh, random overthrow of the governments or whatever, th that type of insurgencies and what all. So they had put tons and tons. I believe the amount that Germany had in there was 1,500 tons of gold, just themselves. Well, anyhow, they came forward and asked for it, and the Federal Reserve said, oh, no, you can't get it right now. Uh-oh, what's wrong with that picture? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if you got if you got a couple thousand dollars of mine, I would be upset. But if you had a couple thousand tons of gold of mine, I would really be upset. Uh, you know, it's kind of figures that the, the average guy can't even perceive. Uh, so following that, there were several other nations that came forward. They asked for their gold. And they were told the same thing. And inter interestingly, they were told to kind of get back in 2020, in the year 2020, they could probably get a good audit or some of their gold. That was kind of what the original answer was. And then, of course, we had Ron Paul came forward in Washington, and he has for several years said uh, he wants an audit. You know, we, we require an audit. The United States wants to know if the gold is there, because he agrees with me, and that is that it's gone. And, of course, they told him the same thing. Basically, they just said, go away. You have no right to even require or request at the senator congressional level that you do not have the right, because that's the way it's set up in terms of the Federal Reserve creation and regulations Nobody outside of their own group of bankers had the ability to audit or even request an audit. And, of course, that doesn't happen. Uh, you know, that's kind of like um, whatever, having um, um, uh, Al Capone keep track of the mobsters for you or something like that. So that doesn't happen. <laughs> right. All right. So, all right, so now we have – now that kind of like really bothers me, and I'm listening to that and watching that and all, and I thought, you know, what's wrong with that picture? And then Donald Rumsfeld, the guy that was in charge of the Department of Defense at that time, uh, came forward on the floor of the Congress. Now, this is important. It's the date that he did this, the day before the 9-11 terrorist event in New York. Rumsfeld came forward on the floor of the Congress and said that he had lost the, de the Department of Defense had lost 2.3 trillion dollars uh, he said it went back a few years but apparently they just can't locate it they don't know where it went 2.3 trillion over about 10 years then of course we had the next day was the event that um, occupied the news for the next seven, eight months, for crying out loud, and that was the outrageous event in New York City. End of story. You never heard again. You never heard a word about Rumsfeld and the Department of Defense missing and losing their money. And by the way, that amount of money equals $8,000 for every man, woman, and child in the United States of America. That's how much that is. Wow. Okay, so let's move forward. What else bothered me? Uh, the woman who is in charge of keeping track of the Federal Reserve distribution of funds from uh, the Federal Reserve into international banking, she came out and somebody asked her on the floor of the Congress and an inquiry uh, that they had understood that somehow there was $9 trillion off of the books progressively over the last few years of the banking Federal Reserve being lent out to people, banks, bank systems 
in Europe, but that they understood it was, quote, unquote, off the books, and it was not really definable as to where it had gone. And she had not acknowledged that that was a fact. Uh, so there is nine trillion. Now, we're not even talking billions. We're talking trillion here. And, again, it was progressive over a period of time, but basically she said uh, that she would look into it. But, yeah, she understood there was sort of a, you know, again, they just they just point, were not positive where it had gone to. So, anyhow, done deal. There goes uh, 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 nine trillion. By the way, that works out to about $30,000 for every man, woman, and child in the United States of America. So we're almost getting serious money here. Um, so anyhow, when I, I put all this together, and then there was many, many other uh, outrageous um, uh, situations with um, huge, gigantic amounts of money just vanishing progressively over 10, 15, 20 years. So uh, now you got to realize, see, there's no way to, to money launder a trillion dollars. Not one tri- you can't one trillion, and we're talking two point three vanished from the defense department uh if you were slick enough to embezzle that out of the uh, out of the funding of the defense department, uh you can't go to the local bank and and hide it in your safety deposit box all right uh not even you know Pablo Escobar, the drug smuggling operations they couldn't do anything with that, so I sat you know and I was sitting I was thinking. What in the world, where could money like that go to? What are we talking about here? And again, it's 20, 30 years maybe altogether. This is a total outrageous volume vanished. And then I remembered somebody in 94 had come to me, and not just one person, but many people. And I was involved with a bunch of different things, and I testified before the U.S. Uh, Intelligence Committee myself in Washington on a couple of things. And the bottom line was uh, I recalled somebody saying, Bob, do you, are you familiar with the underground facilities that they're building all over the United States? these giant underground hideouts. And, of course, I said, well, you know, I was familiar with some of the mil- the military operations, of course, and uh, I knew we had some of the biggest and best underground facilities on Earth for NORAD and that type of, uh, you know, operations. And then, of course, somebody said, well, you know, I'm talking about uh, like like even at the um, uh, the Denver airport is a giant underground facility. And, of course, I had a friend that was real close to that and a couple other people that were involved in the financing and what have you of uh, uh, government and uh, what, and all of that. So I was familiar, and I also was familiar that that had gone from being a construction of a fancy airport into being uh, extraordinarily over budget. I mean, they kept going, you know, $40 billion, 40, 40, 40 million here, 60 million there, 20 million here. I mean, it was just kept going right through the ceiling in terms of cost factor. And after they finished it in 95 and, and opened it up for use, uh, I had gone with a friend of mine and we snuck down underneath, underground, into some of the facilities below, and they were huge. They were gigantic. We had tunnels and tunnels and all kinds of offices and what have just all kinds of things underneath there. Had nothing to do with the with the uh, airplanes coming in and out, and uh, entire seven floor buildings that were buried underground there and what have you. Um, under and to date, now that was in '95, and I actually photographed and got some film, whatever that actually somebody ended up stealing, but. Um, it doesn't make any difference because now we do have we we have a lot more. Uh, I have live footage underneath these facilities uh, as we speak. But the uh, uh, the point was uh, that that was a heads up for me. And then I I have remember talking to some truck drivers said they had gone from one facility to another facility probably 800 miles away driving in his 18 wheeler 40 foot truck making deliveries between different points underground. And um, uh, by the way, we're talking about uh, facilities so large that two lanes cross each other for 18-wheelers underground and 
mag levitated trains going uh, as fast as the speed of sound underground from one mm-hmm. location to another. Uh, so uh, the the next point in in my uh, in in my uh, uh, process of uh, looking into this stuff uh, was the, uh, also the realization that um, some, somebody had come to me. That, and here's what had happened. Uh, sorry to explain this. Once I got involved with all of this stuff and had been doing it for 30 years. I had so many people coming, and and they would say, "Hey, you know, I work for the CIA, or I work for this, or I work for that," and and I mean, I would meet them in you know some cases face to face. Several of them became friends, and they would just say, "Look, I can't say I can't come out. I'll get blown away, you know." But but let me just give you this, and I would get a packet of information, or I get some photographs, or I would get this, or get that, or whatever, and that happened over and over again. Because so many of the bad guys were the same bad guys, interfaced with people 10, 20 years ago, and now they're mixed with a different group, maybe three or four other guys, and they're carrying out more covert operations around the world uh, doing A, B, and C. So I, that was what had happened to me, see. So I, it ended up where I was like a, a sounding board, and I used to, again, uh, when different investigations came up, congressmen, senatorial offices, et cetera, would call me and they would say, hey, we're looking into this. Do you have anything with this guy and that guy or that bank or this? And I would say either no, I don't, uh, or I would say, oh, yeah, wait a minute. Uh, he was involved with A, B, and C over there. Bob Fletcher, are you there? Yes, sir, I sure am. Can well, you hear we me? Are, yes, we can hear you great. And we're just we just want to hear everything you're willing to share with us tonight. Um we we have actually played audio bites from your recent visit uh to InfoWars with Alex Jones and we, we had noticed and I know that you did too that uh that Alex is very uncomfortable with the Planet X subject. <laughs> yes, he is. But then again, you know, the bottom line is, first off, it's very scary stuff, uh, you know, and, and I would wish that I was wrong, but I don't believe I am. Uh, and, of course, the bottom line is simply, you know, when this planet would approach really close or fairly close, that doesn't have to get, ter- you know, terribly close to our backyard, but once it passes by, uh, everything hits the fan. But what happens with an awful lot of people, and that, and it's all right because it's totally understandable, the bottom line, like with Alex. Now, Alex, <clears throat> Alex literally had used to, he introduced me most of the times when I was on his program. He would introduce me as the one guy that actually persuaded him to go full-time into the radio uh, the radio talk show business, period, Bob Fletcher. Uh, and then he used to follow that with a caveat and say that uh, everything Bob has ever found out or discovered or exposed has turned out to be 100% right. And he used to say, listen to Bob Fletcher, because he's never been wrong. And, of course, now I've been doing this pursuit of corrupted people in government for 30 years. All right, so that's why you go back to when Alex was still in school and listening and watching my my exposés himself. Now, that was the way he introduced me. But uh, the day um, uh, that I talked about uh, the incoming of Nibiru, um, he was freaked out. He, um, uh, and, the, and the bottom line is this. Uh, he's scared. It's an internal thing. I'm not going to say that it's financial. I believe it's totally an, an internal, personal thing with him. And, and the concept, the things that I was talking about, are, are very frightening. And some people, um, you know, are just not going to buy into it until it's, uh, you know, until it's a, a, a vivid, in-your-backyard, it's-all-over kind of a situation. And uh, up to that point, there are many people, including Alex, uh, that, that are just um, uh, frightened off by this. Now, 
what I, w- I was going to throw. Like to, uh, yes, we, go ahead. Well, yes. I, I wanted to get uh, Doctor Beer. Kenneth, Kenneth Beer is with us. Uh, he's our. He, he's he, he's been doing the radio show here with us now since all the way back to 2011 when we started it, and uh, he's really familiar with your work uh, all the way back to WWCR uh, and Shortwave Patriot Radio. And 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 uh, Kenneth worked with Bill Cooper in Kaji back in the 90s. Kenneth, say hello. Hey Bob, it's it's good to actually hear you on the show. I remember hearing you years ago on Patriot Broadcast Networks and various uh, uh, forums, and it's it's amazing that you're actually on the show now. So I'm all ears tonight, and I can't wait to hear what you're going to share. But I've followed you for so long, and I'm kind of like Alex Jones with you. You opened my eyes. Well, <clears throat> thank you. I greatly appreciate that. And and. What I probably should do is I have to do this very briefly because uh, I've been doing it so long, and my personal story is so complex and what have you that. But but I, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. But for the people that do not know who I am, they can go, of course, to my website, which is BobFletcherInvestigations.com. Now, if you just go on Google and put in Bob Fletcher, uh, you'll end up there also because um, I get I'm kind of like all over the place there, like a sort of like a bad fungus, I guess. But uh, uh, at least to the uh, to the bad guys in government. Um, so as a matter of fact, I I had to quote uh, Senator Kerry, John Kerry, who's now of course Secretary of State. I had assisted his offices profusely many years ago in one of the inquiries relative to drugs and government officials. And um, I had just run for the United States Congress in 1990, and uh, he asked me uh, what if, if I. Had, and matter of fact, I almost took that seat. But he asked me uh, what what would have happened if I had taken the the seat and become the uh, up there in Congress. And I jokingly said, "Well, I would be the biggest pain in the butt that they ever had in Washington." And uh, Senator Kerry's um, uh, response there was that he said, I got news, you already are one of the biggest pains in the butts in Washington. And that was, of course, back in 1990. That's a long time ago. But uh, it's one of the best best things I ever heard out of um, a senator's mouth out of Washington, D.C., that I was already causing them uh, uh, more grief than they wanted to, to uh, share. But uh, for those folks who don't know me, I got involved totally non-intentionally. Um, I had a company, was taken over. I merged. It's not taken over. It's not, well, yeah, maybe that is the right word. I merged my company with another company in Atlanta, Georgia, in 1985 or 86, that period of time. And it turned out to be run and operating by a covert central intelligence national security operative who supplies weapons for all of the small wars that we re- you referred to just a few minutes ago around the world um, that have been taking place. Uh, this was a central intelligence operation. They took over my business to use it as a covert front. And then and again, it's totally unknown to myself. There's no way of knowing that until you're already into it. Uh, once I had signed papers and merged, and a few months into it, uh, then I started meeting all of these uh, military generals and officers and covert operatives and uh, 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 Lieutenant Colonel Bo Greitz at that time. is a good friend of mine. Uh, at this point in time, at that time, I met him. Uh, when he had just come back from doing uh, covert uh, operations looking for prisoners of war, and that was in 86, that period of time. Uh, and they were still, um, uh, Bo was still bringing uh, and getting uh, prisoners of war out of the old Vietnam War. Uh, and uh, these people, of course, who I'm talking about that supply the weapons for all these small wars uh, make multi, multi millions of dollars. And, of course, they also end up being involved with drug smuggling, Oliver North and all of that, Iran, Contra business. I was a witness in that and then became, because of it chasing pe- those people, uh, one, of course, leads to another. I became involved with at least eight to ten very serious 